Cool. So uh, thanks for the intro. I'm actually the development and communications manager for Good Alternatives Bay Area. Um, we're a national organization. Um, we have offices um, all up and down California in, um, in Colorado and in DC. Uh, and I work specifically for uh, the Bay Area programs. Um, so GRID was founded uh, back in 2004 in the Bay Area, right, uh, right in Oakland. It's funny because I usually say right here in Oakland, but I've actually been uh, down in LA since all the shelter in place things happened. So it's sort of a, a weird thing for me to be talking about our local work when I'm not actually local at the moment. Um, but GRID was founded in the Bay Area. Um, and basically the, the reason that our founders started Good Alternatives is because uh, they thought clean energy had an access problem. Um, Low-income communities are disproportionately impacted by pollution and climate change. They spend four times more of their income on their utility bills, um, and they're being, in general, just underserved by the growing solar industry. Um, so Erica Mackey and Tim Sears, our founders, wanted to solve um, and a grid. Um, so grid, we believe that a successful transition to clean energy must include everyone. Um, and our mission is to make renewable energy technology and job training accessible to underserved communities. Uh, the main ways that we've sort of tried to increase access to renewable energy up until I'd say even last year is through our solar program and our job training programs. Um, we're the nation's largest nonprofit solar installer and job training organization. Um, and we provide direct solar installation and technical assistance. Um, we do no cost solar and I'll talk about the different um, programs that we offer within solar. And then we also have a large workforce development um, program. We do job training. Um, we think that the, the benefits that clean energy and the renewable energy industry can provide are, are not exclusive to just generating clean energy and cost savings. They're also to a, a growing job market. And we wanna make sure that the same communities that we serve with our no cost solar are able to access employment opportunities in the solar industry as well. Um, and then more recently, um, we have entered the space of clean mobility. So we wanna expand um, our impact beyond just solar um, and to increase access to clean mobility options to the same communities that we serve with our solar program. Um, and then we can do any of the work that we do uh, without policy being on our side. Um, and policy isn't always on our side, um, less so in the past couple of years than it had been in the past. Um, but we have a, uh, a policy team based in Oakland that um, advises on low income solar and clean mobility access um, on the local level, on the state level, um, and sort of we work in communities where there are programs available, there are funding available, and our policy team makes sure to try and, and get those areas to continually expand. Um, a little snapshot of our impact to date. Um, so since 2004, when we first installed, um, I think we installed in San Francisco, like two to three systems that year. Um, today, and this is pre-COVID, pre we install about 1600 solar systems a year across the country. Um, and our impact to date has generated um, over $400 million in lifetime savings for our clients, prevented the emissions of a million tons of greenhouse gas um, into the atmosphere, and we've trained over 32,000 volunteers um, in hands-on skills building in um, how to install solar. Uh, so a little closer look at the a snapshot of some of the programs that we offer. The first is single family solar, and that's the bread and butter of what GRID was founded on. Um, this is us installing no cost solar on the rooftops of single family homes for low income homeowners. Um, and when I say, say low income, historically the definition that we use at GRID Alternatives for low income is 80% or below the area median income of wherever they live. Um, and if we want to get into the details of, of how the funding is, is a little bit more specific to income, I can talk about that. It's just not necessarily the most interesting, but happy to go into that more. Um, so single family solars, we do no cost solar, um, full installation services, uh, warranty, operation and maintenance um, on the rooftops uh, of families that live in and own their home. Um, and that has historically been the majority of our work. It still is the majority of our work today, but that's changing as we move forward and we try to focus more on multifamily and community solar. Um, and the reason that we're transitioning um, is so that we can expand our reach um, and 
The reason for that is that there is just a limited amount of folks in the United States that even have the ability to benefit from rooftop solar. And I'm talking just in general, if you looked at the US population, only about 25% of people have the ability to benefit from rooftop solar for a single family program. Um, and that's for a few reasons. One is that you have to um, own your home in order to decide to put solar on your own home. Um, you have to have a roof that's good for solar, so one that's going to last 20 to 25 years. It has to be facing the right direction. There can't be too much shade. So there are a lot of limitations to being able to access the benefits of rooftop solar. If we expand to multifamily and to community, then we're touching that 75% that we couldn't touch with just single family. Um, and if you're zooming in on the populations in the communities that Grid Alternative serves, so it's low income, um, low income communities, that percentage of folks that could benefit from single family solar is much lower than 25%. Um, and that's why moving forward, we're investing a lot in programs in multifamily and community solar. Um, and in general, and again, you can talk a little bit more about this uh, based off of um, what some of the specific questions you all have are, but um, multifamily solar is us installing solar on affordable housing developments. Um, and we access funding for this through a program called SOMA, Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing. There's about a billion dollars available um, through, I think, let me check the year. Open through 2030 um, to provide, to install solar on multifamily affordable housing developments. Um, and then community solar is another interesting and even and a bit trickier. Um, the idea behind community solar is to install large solar projects, fields somewhere near a community. So it doesn't have to be on a specific building or on specific rooftops. Um, and residents of that community can benefit from the savings or from the electricity, the clean electricity that that solar field, that community solar project is developing. So they sign on as subscribers and get a discount on the utility bill. And then that project is also generating clean energy for the grid and for the community. Um, and it's just really, so multifamily solar increases the reach a lot and then community even more so because you don't have to have a roof over your head that has solar on it or be somewhere where there's a ground mount right next to you and you can still access the benefits, the savings and the health benefits that solar is providing. Um, and then the last two areas of our solar projects, um, solar programs, we have a tribal program where we partner with Native American tribal communities across the country to install solar uh, in their communities. Um, this is super important because a lot of the rebates and incentives available for our single family projects or even for the multifamily projects are not available on tribal lands. So we'll partner directly with the communities, we'll do co-fundraising with them so that they can benefit from solar and we do job training initiatives in those communities as well. Um, our Bay Area office has a sister office on the North Coast that um, does almost exclusively solar or tribal solar installations with about 17 tribes on California's North, North Coast. And then we also have an international program that um, works on projects in Nepal, Nicaragua, and Mexico. Uh, and we'll partner with rural communities, largely communities that are off grid, um, to, to learn what their energy access problems are, what, how they could benefit the most from solar projects, uh, and then work alongside them to install those projects. And we have trips so, so volunteers can raise funds for that project, travel to that location, and, and work alongside the community to install those projects. Um, the second area of our work historically has been uh, workforce development, so that's job training programs. A few different things that we focus on here. Um, one of them is job training partnerships with uh, local job training organizations that have larger co cohorts that are maybe doing construction training um, and they'll spend a week or a couple of days of, with GRID to learn how specifically to do learn solar installation skills. Uh, we also have high school and college programs. Um, so that is to illuminate sort of career pathways in the solar industry to high school students and to college students, um, be that on the technical side or on the, the finance side. Um, we have a solar spring break program uh, and a program called Solar Futures where we work with, with high school students who aren't necessarily on the college track but um, and wouldn't know otherwise about careers in the solar industry. Uh, and then we have a women in solar program. Uh, women make up about 25, 26% of the solar industry. And if you zoomed in on construction jobs, that's gonna be significantly lower. And that's definitely something that GRID is trying to change. 
Uh, and then we have a Solar Corps paid fellowship program, which is a partnership with AmeriCorps. Um, it's a, a service learning fellowship year where folks who are interested in a career in the industry can spend a year working at GRID and all of our different departments to learn about nonprofit work, to learn about renewable energy industry um, and sort of jumpstart their, their careers that way. Um, and then the last area, uh, and this is the newest, which is why it's not necessarily built into our, uh, my presentation uh, as naturally as the others, is clean mobility. Um, so I think I mentioned that GRID started in 2004. Our clean mobility program started in 2018. Uh, I started at GRID in 2018, so my GRID career is about as old as our clean mobility work is. Um, but it's also, uh, it's super exciting. And again, we're talking about trying to focus on how we can increase impact in the communities we're trying to serve. Um, sort of focusing in the clean mobility space is, is a great way to increase impact. Um, so a little bit about why we decided to come get into clean mobility and into transportation. Um, communities of color are disproportionately impacted by pollution from both gasoline consumption and gasoline production. Um, and that includes disproportionate exposure to airborne lead poisoning from the era of, of lead, lead gas. Um, so the same communities that we're trying to reach with solar are disproportionately impacted by the pollution generated by gasoline consumption and production. Um, and the same sort of problem we're trying to solve and that they were spending more money on their electricity bills is that these same families, these low income families are spending about 75 to $78 billion a year on gasoline. Um, and in California, the transportation sector accounts for about 41% of total greenhouse gas emissions. So if we're trying to make a larger impact, we needed to expand beyond solar and clean mobility and transportation was sort of the clear, clear next step um, for those programs. Um, and we're doing a few programs and I'll jump to the next slide here, but we can um, also transition to jump into to questioning. Um, but our main program so far, and again, we're about a year and a half in here. Um, we have a clean cars for all program. That's a scrap and replace program to try and get gas guzzling cars off of the road and more and more cleaner vehicles. So that partners um, commuters with incentives available for them to trade in gas guzzling cars um, and purchase a cleaner vehicle. It's up to nine each each of those incentives is up to $9,500. Um, and then we also have a few projects where we're trying to increase EV charging infrastructure. Um, so a lot of the reasons why, one of the reasons why people maybe aren't getting a, an EV or a hybrid plug-in is because there's nowhere to charge. And so we're trying to solve both of those problems, right? We're trying to increase the infrastructure for charging um, and also increase the access to purchasing and the affordability to getting a cleaner vehicle as well. Um, and then another thing that GRID wants to try and solve is become kind of this one-stop shop for people who are interested in learning about how you can have cleaner mobility options, what's available in your community, um, if you can purchase a car, what, what, what's even there. It's kind of a maze to try and understand. Um, and so we're, we're piloting a way to aggregate all of the clean mobility incentives to help assist folks in determining eligibility for ways um, to get access to cleaner mobility. And that, I think that maybe I will pause as the overview spot, um, if that makes sense, and we can, can switch to answering questions. Sure. Um, maybe I'll kick it off with a couple and then we can switch over to Q&A in a few minutes. Um, so one of the questions that I had since we're on this slide is I know that um, GRID has also been working with uh, on the Air Resources Board Clean Mobility Options Program for Shared Mobility. Um, are you familiar with that? Can you share anything about um, what GRID is doing on shared mobility? Um, so I can, most of the funding for all of our clean mobility programs come from, from CARB and from the cap, the cap and trade program. So all of the things that I'm talking about are coming from that same sort of funding pot. Um, these are the ones that I'm familiar with that we're like actively working on now. I think another um, uh, area that our clean mobility team are specifically like looking into is how to um, increase sort of the availability or the use of electric um, uh, buses or shared cargo vans in areas where like people don't actually have cars so that there can be access to shared mobility that's cleaner. Um, we aren't 
actively now ha don't have any programs that we're putting into the pilot phase that specifically focus on that, but it's definitely something that our team has started working on and building as well. Okay. Um, and then let me ask as well, um, uh, you know, we are working, we're doing this in cooperation with the Women's Environmental Network. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk about any institutional sexism that, um, that you see in your work, um, either in on the workforce that you talked about it a bit, but also for the people you're serving. Um, and then uh, as well, any institutional racism or other issues that you're seeing. Um, I know you talked about it on the mobility side, but also for, for the solar side. Sure, I think that there's a there's clearly a direct link between climate justice and racial justice. And I think that they're like solar and um, workforce and job training is not, it's, it, it's not excluded from those issues. Um, I think that, that you can see like at the base level we're talking about sexism, the fact that such a small percentage of the solar workforce um, speaks largely to that. Um, I've been in solar for about four years or so. Um, and I've worked on the, the, the sales side and the finance side, and I've had almost all male colleagues um, at Grid Alternatives. I have a majority of female colleagues, and it's definitely a different space. And I think that, the, that we're promoting the voices of female leadership. A lot of our regional offices have specific women in solar programming where we focus on uh, networking events um, for women that are working in renewable energy to be able to interact and sort of hear the voices of other women who have been working and sort of climb to the top or just starting and, and talking about their experiences. Um, and then I think if um, like the core level, one of the issues with sexism is just if we're doing job training, it's construction work, right? Solar installation is construction work. Construction is historically sexism, sexist as well. Um, and we've talked a lot about how we can change the way that we talk about our staff on site. We've had solar installation supervisors that are women that weren't taken seriously by clients or weren't taken seriously by volunteers or weren't taken seriously by their like other construction staff because they were women. Um, and it's conversations that we have internally all the time and we talk differently about, um, try to speak differently about our staff so that it's more inclusive. Um, we've partnered with job training organizations that have complete women's cohorts on construction. Um, so to try and make sure that there's more training available for women. Um, but we see it, we see it all the time. We're, we're not immune to it internally either. And then it's conversations that we have um, at GRID as well. Okay. That was the sex <laughs> Also the race question is, um, yeah. Um, I've been thinking a lot about it and I'm like recognizing my place here as a white woman um, talking about that and um, that I may, not, I may not always be the person, the right person to have to, to be speaking on behalf of that. And I've been doing a lot of reflection lately on that as well. Um, I think that uh, if you look about, if you talk about racism in the solar industry specifically, um, most of and we can look at GRID, right? So GRID has a, about 49% of our staff are made up of people of color. We're a solar company. Um, but if you sort of looked at where those demographics are coming from, majority of, those, of, of that is gonna come from construction jobs or from outreach jobs that historically have uh, less um, ability to, to climb and get raises and are on the base level making less money. And I don't think GRID has solved it internally um, and the solar industry at large hasn't solved it or even spent enough time thinking about it. Um, but I think that we're, we're having the conversations. EID uh, is super important at GRID and it's something that we talk to all of our for-profit solar partners about as well um, and try to make sure that there are less barriers to entry um, that we're doing sort of, um, we're doing bias training um, and having these conversations in creating more opportunity and elevating the voices of, of the Black community and people of color as well. Great. Thanks for the thoughtful responses. Um, and we do have a lot of questions from the audience. So let's get going. The first question, I think, was from Nathan. So Zach, if you could unmute Nathan, he can read his own question. Uh, 
Uh oh, I can't hear you, Nathan. All right, I'm gonna, oh, no. Okay, let's, um, while Nathan thinks about his connection, I, we have the next question from An. Hi, everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Danny, can you um, elaborate further on the sources of funding for these types of projects? Uh, are they, where are they coming from? Are they grants from other nonprofits and government agencies uh, or, or, or private donations? Can you talk more about that? Yes, I definitely can. So I, the majority of my job is fundraising, so I um, uh, can definitely talk about that. If we're um, talking about, so I'll sort of talk about the different programs and where the, the different funding comes from for those. So for solar, um, single family and multifamily, the SOMA project is funding from the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, so it's, um, and if you want to even more detail, uh, is there's like a special program fee that everyone pays on their utility bill if you have PG&E or wherever you're calling in from. Um, so that special program fee that the ratepayers pay goes into this chunk of money and the CPUC then designates that to low income solar. Um, so that is where uh, a good portion of our, our funding comes from for our solar projects. Um, that bucket of funding for single family does not cover the cost um, does not cover the full cost of a system. So we couple that with, with as many other funding services as we can. Um, one of those for single family is through third party ownership, a TPO partnership with Sunrun. Um, so we're a nonprofit organization, so we can't benefit from the tax credit for solar. Uh, our clients don't have tax liability, so they can't benefit from the tax, the tax credit for solar. Um, so that's why we have a third party partner and that cover, helps to cover 30% of the cost of the system as well. And then on top of that, we have corporate funding, we have uh, local partnerships with the cities or with um, the like NCE or um, EBCE, so like the, the community choice aggregates as well provide funding for that. Um, SOMA funding for multifamily um, is almost exclusively covered by, by the CPUC funding for the project. Um, and I don't think I mentioned this, but another aspect of SOMA is that is for there to be trainees, job trainees on all of those installations. So GRID helps sort of couple put um, paid trainees on those installs as well. Um, and then the funding for our clean mobility programs um, comes, as I mentioned, from um, from CARB, the California Air Resources Board, and the cap and trade, the cap and trade market. And then just on top of that, I'm like constantly applying for foundation grants and corporate grants and community partnerships. Um, we're always looking for ways to fill in the gaps on funding for all of our programs. And I'll just jump in on there because I worked at the CPUC and the authorization of SOMA and the um, multifamily, uh, yes. community solar, sorry. Um, and I think part of uh, the, the funding for that also was at, at the direction of the legislature. So the legislature said, California Public Utilities Commission, you must authorize something for uh, low income and disadvantaged communities. All right, let's get to, um, looks like Zach, you had a question. Yeah, and then I guess we can go back to Nathan. Sure. Um, yeah, so um, I've actually been doing a lot of work on building electrification, and I know there's there's some interesting like equity and air pollution issues there as well. Um, and especially as we start transforming the the gas system to be or the buildings to be more um, based on electrification, there could be an issue where low income customers get left behind. Um, and there's new programs to. Uh, that the CBC is developing to to um, kind of help incentivize that for affordable housing and so forth. So I'm wondering if if you all have, have thought about incorporating that. I think that our, our policy team works a lot on electrification as well. Um, and I think that everything has a, an access, every program, if you're talking about renewables, like this is all new technology and it's all expensive and the people that are going to have access to it first, the people that have money to pay for it. and um, we're, it's never, it's not usually top of mind when you're thinking about these things to include folks who can't afford to pay for it. And I think that's what Grid's policy team is always trying to do is to make sure that, that the, the voices of those communities are being considered as policy changes um, around 
sort of more renewables and electrification happens as well. And I think that there's a lot that happens beside, behind the scenes on the policy side before it gets down to the, the, the me side, which is like where we're actually running the programs and where we can start um, implementing them in the community because that's where I come in and then that's where I try to get ex like additional funding for those. But um, I think on the, on the policy side, we're, we're always thinking about where the voices of marginalized these are not being heard and how they can be included as, as these policies become, um, become developed. Great, shall we try Nathan again? Uh, can you hear her now? Yes. Okay, I don't know what happened last time. Um, yeah, so most of my, I was uh, intrigued when you said that uh, the big portion of multifamily uh, Compo the, the big portion of GRID's multifamily projects are on affordable housing projects. I, I think generally um, one like among the, the those of us within the YIMBY movement who are in favor of just uh, of building as much as possible like in the abstract one might think putting solar on a, a project would increase the construction costs tremendously and sort of uh, hinder the possibility of a uh, project being built. So I'm curious, like, are affordable housing developers uh, keen on putting solar uh, on their projects? And like, is it, and, and, and why? How do those savings get passed on to the residents? What's the payback period? How much, how much does it increase construction costs for the project overall? Yeah, that's a, um, that's a great question. I think that, that for what I'm familiar with on the multifamily side is we're mostly doing, um, we're adding solar to existing affordable housing units um, and the savings on the utility bills um, that's generated by that solar system goes directly towards the residents themselves. Um, I think, and I don't know, I know that solar is required for new construction in California and single family homes. And I don't want to say that I know for sure that it's also required on, multi on multifamily buildings, but um, my sense is, is that if it's not yet, it probably will be soon. Um, and I think it's something that's definitely included. We've worked with Habitat Humanity for Humanity on new developments um, and they're required to put solar on those as well. Um, so I think that there's less of a, a question of if but that they have to and how can they um, do and who are they going to partner with to do that and um, when because we, we have sort of the same goals and communities that we want to reach um, grid is often kind of a natural partner sometimes to, to do the solar side on that stuff. Thank you. All right, how about Cliff. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so thank you for presenting to us. This is really interesting. Um, I'm wondering, the last slide you had was about the mobility options. Um, and it was pretty focused on electric automobiles. I'm wondering if your group has helped to em empower people to get things like electric bikes and cargo bikes or pursue other non-automotive transportation options? Sure, um, I think there's definitely been conversations with the like go bikes in the Bay Area about how um, can get free or discounted access um, to that. I don't know where those conversations lie, but it's definitely there, they've happened at Grid. Um, another option for the Clean Cars for All program is if folks wanna trade in their car, their gas guzzling car and just get a transportation voucher, they can get that as well instead of getting another vehicle. Um, but I do think that, that you're right in pointing out that to start, and again, we started in 2018, a lot of it is focused on actual vehicles um, and charging infrastructure. And I think that we're gonna see that adapt and change over time um, as well. Thanks. Um, I'll also jump in that I was chatting with someone at GRID recently, um, Zach Franklin. And he was mentioning that um, there's also some work that's kind of in, uh, in the works, but hasn't come to fruition yet of looking at um, 
team mobility options where communities get to think about what works best for them. And that I think one of them was thinking about bike share, whereas others were thinking about car share. And um, so I'll be curious to see what comes out of that, but it may be some other things um, besides yeah. individuals owning cars as well. Yeah, definitely, thanks. Um, okay, and I think Tom raised his hand. There we go. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, weigh in a little more on that e-bike um, program. I'm actually working with some of the grid staff on the King Car For All um, uh, e-bike expansion with the Bayer Quality Management District. Um, the Air District is really enthusiastic about it. It's, it's a pretty interesting sounding program with a $7,500 subsidy um, for a household for the purchase of e-bikes, which of course could get you a fully loaded cargo bike, you know, with all the accessories that you need and not just the basic bike um, plus, or a couple of, a couple of commuter bikes also, you know, fully loaded. So it's really a serious program that, um, um, that I'm quite excited about, um, and looks like it will probably roll out later this year. Um, with all the usual disclaimers about anything that has to work through a government bureaucracy. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's the, that's the, that's the goal. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this as, as part of a complex of, of interest that we're seeing from, um, you know, from some of the local governments as well and expanding e-bike um, subsidy programs. So I'm really interested in talking with anyone, anyone on the call who has um, interest in e-bikes and how we're, how we're promoting them. Um, I'd be happy to, to chat with afterwards. I've been doing a lot of study of them and their fantastic um, efficiency and, and carbon efficacy. Thank you. And it's fun working with Grid on this. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Are you working with Marie? I'm just like yeah with with Renee and and uh, and Marie Renee was okay. the one who actually linked me up um, on this and has had a passion for it um, and uh, yeah and Marie and, and Rebecca over at the air quality management district Rebecca awesome. and Tin Lee cool. all right um, I think on had another question Yes, so Danny, you talked about um, how grid started in California, so that's where you have the most, uh, I guess, projects, mm -hmm. and then you branch out to other states and other countries. So looking at the U.S. state, what state do you see the most potential in terms of growth for the company and the, the, the numbers of projects? And then uh, related to that, you know, what state do you see have, you know, more friendly policies to support clean energy, to support clean mobility uh, and such? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll speak to it as much as I uh, can. And I think I only know uh, enough to be dangerous so I can speak to what I'm familiar with and um, hope I, I think I'm going to um, take note of some of the questions I wasn't fully able to answer and I can share. I, I can reach out to some of my colleagues and expand on that as well. Um, so yes, California for sure. Um, we have seven offices up and down California. California uh, has um, the uh, most open policy, the most funding for programs that we um, that we run specifically. Um, I think second to that, we have an office in, in Denver and in Colorado. So doing a lot of work in Colorado. Colorado has actually done some community solar already. Um, so I think that there's a lot of potential there in that space. Um, and then we also work in uh, Washington, DC. So we're already on the ground there. So those are the areas where clearly we have the most potential and potential to growth to grow. Um, we also just started working on workforce development training in, um, in Illinois. So I think that there's, there's some support um, on the job training side of things in Illinois, and we're excited to see where that goes. Um, beyond that, I know that we, we did have an office um, in New York for a little while because it looked like there's definitely um, support for solar. It's growing, it, it's growing there as well, um, and it ended up being a bit a bit harder than we thought, um, and we weren't able to keep the office open there. I think that if you, in, in general, like wherever solar policy, um, where, wherever the utilities aren't making it impossible to install solar is where we'd be able to have some room um, on our side as well. But I think that on 
And as we kind of mentioned, is like when you're thinking about renewables, the communities we serve aren't always the first ones to benefit. And so it's gonna take the states to want to invest in solar in general or to open it up for, to solar in general to start. And then after that, is there is there gonna be support and funding for, for our initiatives and programs? Um, so I think that our, our, our policy team does a good job of trying to identify and work in those states. We also partner a lot with Vote Solar, who works across the country in different areas to sort of advocate for solar policy. And they're always thinking about um, marginalized and low-income communities as well. Um, I, I hope it'll be more, um, more states moving forward, but it's definitely slow. And when I worked on the, the like finance side of solar, um, and just trying to get people to be able to, like for them to make sense for someone who wants to pay for solar for it to make sense for them was hard in a lot of states. Um, but when I was on that side, the Northeast, um, there was a lot of growth, Massachusetts. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll, we'll be seeing more expand, more expansion there as well. Thanks, Danny. Um, maybe I will step in with a question, but folks feel free to keep raising your hands. Um, I'm curious about um, any advice or thoughts you might have about sustainability in multifamily development um, that doesn't qualify for grid programs, because of course, we would love to see more sustainability everywhere. Yeah, um, that's a great question. There's funding for solar. It's Solar is a good investment for, um, for companies and, and, and banks. So there is funding available for solar. Um, Grid also uh, occasionally will do um, install solar on um, mission aligned nonprofits. And we've partnered um, with an organization uh, called Revolve um, that helps provide financing for solar projects. That's the one that I'm most familiar with. Um, I think third party ownership TPO financing is also a good model um, for that because they're able to take advantage of the tax credit and that drastically bring that, brings down the cost of solar. Those are the two that I'm super familiar with. Um, and the project that we just completed in Santa Cruz on the mental health facility um, was in partnership with Revolve. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, we have a question from Anya who um, I'll just add is uh, a representative from Women's Environmental Network. Um, and she'll say a few words at the end, but right now she has a question. Yeah, thanks, Joanna. Uh, thanks, Annie. That was really, um, you know, great to hear. Uh, is there anything specific that you want us as constituents to talk to our, um, you know, to our lawmakers about? Is there anything right now that's really urgent that you need us to bring in front of people that are making these laws possible? Um, that's a fantastic question. I think that on the advocacy side, so GRID is not an advocacy organization. And I've actually seen the transformation of GRID over the past two years um, that has been uh, super interesting and something I've been very proud of is that we, we used to be really neutral in the fact that we didn't want to upset any of our partners or supporters where we got funding from and would just like not even necessarily talk about climate change. Um, and uh, it has, I've seen us sort of take more of a stance and, and be more vocal about that um, in our communications and in our programs. Um, uh, but ultimately, we're not an advocacy organization. So I think that the the um, thing that we that Grid can ask for that we can do, um, we're really supportive of our partners at Vote Solar. They have a lot of um, initiatives that folks can take part in. One of the things that I've been seeing recently, and I think actually most utility companies are are being pretty proactive about, um, is that the impacts of COVID uh, are hitting the communities, are hitting low income um, communities of color, those who live in areas with poor air quality. It's hitting them the hardest. So they're they're you know working lower wage jobs and, and have lost their jobs, um, are, uh, it's harder for them to pay their electric bills. And one of the things that they've been advocate, advocating for is, is for utility companies to promise that they won't shut off electricity right now for folks who are, who are having trouble paying their electric bills. Um, so that's something that I've been seeing folks asking about and Vote Solar sort of advocating for. Um, and yeah, I think on the advocacy side, to, to check in on Vote Solar and see what initiatives that, the, that they're running. I think um, supporting organizations um, like GRID or others that are fighting um, for racial justice and climate justice, like 
I think that's the most important thing that we that we can all um, be doing right now. Thank you. Um, Zach, would you like to ask, um, looks like you've got another question. Sure, yeah, and I, I didn't want to take away if you had some more questions, but um, a lot of people are, you know, going to be asking, um, or I've, I've heard people asking about the, you know, storage uh, for um, wildfire and other forms of, um, uh, you know, situations where you need resiliency for backup power. I'm just wondering, like, do you think that's even like something that would be financially viable in the current, like sort of what the current programs to include that? Or is that, you know, sort of currently something that only um, wealthier customers would, would realistically be able to include? Uh, yes, great question. There is uh, starting to be funding available for storage. There's a program called SGIP, which I do not know what it stands for, um, that is uh, funding um, storage uh, and grid. Well, in the Bay Area, we're actually, um, fingers crossed that everything still happens this year, going to be installing our first so, thanks, self-generation incentive program for SGIP, uh, our first um, storage projects and the there's more funding available in communities that are at higher risk for wildfires um, so we'll be starting there to install um, install storage um, along with solar we also have some pilot programs that we're working on to add so add storage to, for clients that have already had grid solar systems installed um, so very, there, it's early stages. There's like a, like small amounts of funding. It's not something that we're going to be doing on a large scale right away, but it is something that we're starting to do this year and we'll continue to do moving forward and focused at first in communities that are higher risk um, for wildfires and on clients who are, are, you know, they have medical devices that rely on electricity. So ones where there are high risk of power shut off are going to be impacted the most if there is a power shut off. Thanks. Thanks for highlighting the, the medical needs, uh, social justice aspects. Um, I have, I guess, one last question for me, which is when you're involved in a project, at what point does grid get in the picture? When someone's designing or proposing a building or trying to permit it or wait farther along, at what point do you step in? To add this like to add the solar on it for single family or for multifamily or for I would say for, for like a new multifamily development, let's say, or for, yeah. Um, I think that we will help, we design, we'll design the system and install. So I think that if a, uh, if it's a new multifamily building and they need to install solar, they'll partner with grid, hopefully grid. Um, and we would do site visits or talk to them about the plans and design design the system and do the install and do the permitting. So we do all of the, like we're a turnkey service. So we do all of those things from start to finish. Mm -hmm. once they're ready I bet you would, the you would jump in after the building has started to be built already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any last questions? Raise your hand. Going once, going twice. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Before we stop, um, let me just um, invite Anya to say a few words about Women's Environmental Network and closing thoughts uh, before we go. Yeah, thanks, Joanna. And thank you for this opportunity to partner. Um, Women's Environmental Network has been around for more than 23 years in the Bay Area, providing support for women that are working in the environmental sector. I like to think of it as a one-stop shop, you know, if you're trying to enter the environmental sector or you're just wondering, like, if, you know, you need a shift in career or, like, try to dig deeper into some sort of, um, you know, niche, I think this is a place that you want to be. Um, we have a lot of diversity uh, in terms of um, experience and, you know, where women are in their um, life. And I think it, our, our board itself is as diverse as our member group, which is around 3,000 people. And what this uh, group does is a membership is free. You just sign up for a newsletter, become a member, you come to events. Uh, what this group really does is make sure that no one feels that they don't know someone in the environmental sector. So if a woman wanted to do something in solar, she'll have someone else that works in solar that is part of when 
that can kind of walk her through. Uh, and the thing that we have learned is that a lot of people get a lot of new jobs when they come to our events, which is our number one selling factor, even though we're not selling anything. Um, so come to one of our events. We uh, Our website is wencal.org. That's W-E-N-C-A-L. Our next event is a happy hour, uh, which we're doing in uh, partnership with Maker Wine. Maker Wine's giving uh, all members a discount to sample their wines. And we're going to basically be talking about two women who um, figured out that they can start a wine company and they knew nothing about wine. Uh, but it's more, uh, you know, in a series of like, if I can do it, you can do it too. So how are we living our values through entrepreneurship during COVID and during, um, you know, all the things that are going on in our country. So it's very topical. Uh, we also have uh, Green Reads, which is a book club, uh, which now is in um, South Bay, San Francisco, East Bay, and um, also North Bay. And they talk about different books every um, six weeks or so. And now it's all on Zoom, so people can attend four book clubs if they want to. Um, we have an amazing newsletter with a lot of resources for people looking to, um, you know, see their experiences mirrored in other people. Because the one thing we forget is that there's no straight line to a job in the environmental sector. Like everyone's gone through squiggly lines to get to where they are. And so normalizing that and making sure that women know that, you know, it's okay. It's okay to take a break and come back to work, it's okay to like not have started there. It's okay to have felt like this was not your place to be in the environmental sector and then find your passion in the middle of your um, life and go for it. So we kind of live our values through, you know, our board and our members and we would love for you to check it out. Our next event is July 23rd and you can find more details on wencal.org. Thank you so much, Anya. And thank you so much, Danny, for joining us and uh, for all of you who came and had your great questions and uh, we'll see you at an event soon. Thanks thank for you. having me.